cabin was fine. The only thing, the grass needed to be mowed, and the badgers have had a heyday digging holes around the lawn. There's a real nice big badger hole right off our front porch, right in the front lawn. And we have a few cactus on the lawn, and they're beginning to bloom really good right now. This badger hole's kind of under a rock, but boy, is it a big one, and it's been used a lot. We just got ready to paint that whole day, and the next day we'll paint. But that night, Mother Nature put the sun away in a beautiful style right across the Wyoming range. We see a few little ground squirrels out in our lawn. I guess they figure that's their place, since no one's there a lot of the time. They can roam freely. He looks as though he's eaten enough of those grass seeds. He's getting a pot belly on him, maybe a beer belly. The cabin was needing paint really bad, so we hurry and get all the windows and doors and everything taped on it so we can get on with it real soon. I've brought my airless sprayer from home, and we have a ladder over there. So I'm going to climb up, put the paper over the window, and get started spraying real soon now. I can stand on the porch roof and reach the upper part above the porch quite well. But then when I started spraying that oil stain on it, the oil got on the porch roof and it just got slicker than ice. And I went for a tumble, but I didn't quite fall off the roof. There were enough screw heads I was able to get a hold of them. Well, now I'm ready to go, and I'm starting to put a new coat of oil stain on the cabin. Within about two or three hours, once I got the windows taped, I was done with that job. And I'd been putting that off for a long time. And it went so easy and so good with this big hairless sprayer. All the way around the house, I put this oil stain on, and it sure looked a lot better. I'd probably better not wait so long for the next time, though. And inside the cabin, it's still looking good. My spring buck and antelope head that I have mounted is there, and the cabins, uh, cabinets I built are still in good shape, and the table and chairs are there, and then the fish that I mounted on the wall is still there, and the sculptures that Kent made for us, the fish sculptures, add a touch of charm to this log cabin. Most of the interior walls of the cabin are log, but I did like the bathroom walls were just studded up like normal construction. And then I put fish fossils that we dug in a pit down by Kimmer, Wyoming, around on the chimney and also on some of the walls. Looks like Marge is making herself busy at doing a little cooking. She's cooking some of our bass from the Owyhee Canyon. She'll cook a whole bunch of them, and then we can eat them cold. They're good, even cold. And after our job's done, the sun is once again setting over the Wyoming range. The cabin with its brand new coat of paint over everything outside is looking good for a very, very nice sunset. I stepped outside the cabin early that morning and I see we have a visitor. One of the buck antelope and a nice big one is standing there watching. We didn't see many antelope around the cabin, not as many as usual. But we did see quite a few down by Kimmer, 
I don't know whether they're just not there or we just weren't able to see them. And this old doe was with him, and I believe I saw her another time with a little fawn that she probably has stashed. She's one of the does that have fairly big horns. And the old buck looks on as the doe sneaks over closer and closer to get some of that nice tender grass around the cat. You can tell the does from the buck, the doe has no black cheek patch. On the bucks, that black cheek patch is a gland. Within a few days, I have the lawn mowed and the cabin painted and some other things done around it. And so we're going to head out. Past the neighbor's replica of an Indian spirit house and then south till we come to Soda Springs, Idaho. This is one of the spots where free bubble up comes gurgling right out of the ground and especially this being election year I'm sure both parties claim that they're responsible for that but there's a little pond here where it comes right out of the ground and you can take your own containers and dip some of this naturally carbonated water out and then you can mix like uh, Kool-Aid or something like that in with it and you won't be able to tell it from soda pop. Where they mine it nearby, uh, part of the phosphorus they mine out of there is sold for agricultural purposes for phosphate and then the rest of it is sold to Coca-Cola Corporation to make their soda pop bubbly. Marge is going to get her bottles full of this free bubble up. And when you fill your bottles with this free bubble up, you need to seal them up real tight or else it loses its carbonation. And some of the town toughies used to come here and party. They'd bring a jug of whiskey down and use this for their mixer. And they claim it really worked good and it was a nice place for their parties. We came prepared with some grape Kool-Aid Kool like stuff that we pour in to our free bubble up and then we'll make our own soda pop and drink a bunch of it too. I really loaded up on it. It was really good and fresh. But you shouldn't drink too much of this stuff because that phosphorus will leach the calcium out of your teeth and your bones in time but where you just do it once every few years, it probably isn't that severe. I get my free bubble up all made, shake it a little bit, and then it's ready to drink, and boy, is it good. And you really can't tell it from grape soda pop. The big phosphorus mine nearby, they're dumping their red-hot slag down over the hillside as they've done for years and built this mountain of slag. That must be a pretty hot job driving that truck down with that red-hot slag. They dump their load and then they're out of there. We move on up to Twin Falls, Idaho and then we go south to Wells, Nevada. And from Wells, Nevada, we go up a pretty good paved road for about nine miles. And then we take a really pretty well rutted out uh, bumpy road for about two miles up till we get to a hot springs. And I'd highly recommend this hot springs. It was excellent. And if you can't make it up in your vehicle, it's only a two-mile hike. It is a hot creek that flows down, and then the hot springs come out of the hillside in numerous places. We 
pass an old bridge that could no longer be crossed and then there was an irrigation system there. I guess that was before they started using uh, pumps and circular irrigation systems. And it looks like that irrigation ditch and the irrigation head gates are no longer used to this day. We get to the hot springs and go out and test the water. And even the creek is hot here. But the hot springs is just a little warmer than the creek, but yet not too hot. And it's very clear and a very nice rock bottom pool with the water coming right out of the hillside into it. Well, way back when, this looks like it might have been a resort or something because they packed a lot of concrete and made this real long pool that's about three feet deep and it's about 70 feet long I believe and it the water is just absolutely perfect in it. We spent the rest of that evening at the hot springs and we found a place to camp real close to there and we were by ourselves most of the time too so we could really enjoy this hot springs a lot. We used it the next morning until about noon and then it was time we had to start moving on. There's some of the sunstones down in Nevada someplace but I forgot where they were and we never brought our information with us so we're going to go down to Wells and see if we can find someone that knows. It wasn't easy to pull Marge away from this nice, hot, steaming, clear, crystal clear water, but we have to be going. The sunflowers are blooming really good around the edge of this hot stream as we prepare to head out. There are a couple places where we have to ford this little creek. It's called 12 Mile Creek, which is warm. And so we just ease through it. As long as it's not f flood conditions or something, it's no problem. But if the water gets high, it could be a dangerous place to cross. And then down past the old bridge and the irrigation system, which is no longer used to fill the uh, head gates to fill the ditch. Since they're pumping the water directly out of the creek down below in the ranch land. Then another place where we have to ford 12 Mile Creek. It's a little longer and a little deeper here, but still no real problem. We found some watercress growing at a little spring that comes out and runs right down across the road. I never could resist getting some nice fresh watercress, so Marge will pick us a little bit of watercress so we can have it for a salad or a sandwich or something later on today. Then down below we see the circular pivot irrigation systems going round and round the field as they pump the water out of this warm water out of this hot springs creek. Then down to Wells. Wells has pretty much died particularly since they put the new highway in. The old part of town has pretty much died and they build up a little bit of the new part of town out near the new highway. There's still sort of a museum and a visitor center downtown Wells. So we'll go there and see if we can find out about the sunstones and look their exhibits over a little bit. There's an old sheep wagon. Marge likes sheep wagons. And an old stagecoach. all painted up real nice and then 
a medicine wagon and ambulance. We're heading out now. We left Wells and we went on down to Austin, Nevada. There are numerous hot springs come right out in the desert out here by Austin, Nevada. So we'll go out and see what we can find. Wow, what a beautiful evening with the moon rising over the hill just to the east of us. These hot springs were okay, but it was real bright sunlight and also uh, there was no shade at all out here and then it's such easy access that all the great big motor homes started coming in and they were camping right on the edge of the hot springs. That seems to me like that's pretty rude to do that, like taking claiming the hot springs for their very own. There's one pool built of stones with a little deck around it and that's really pretty nice. But then when the motor homes came, it wasn't so nice with them backing right up against it. It even has a valve on it where you can regulate the temperature somewhat. So we used it for a while. There were plenty of birds and friendly jackrabbits right around the hot springs area. There were plenty of stock tanks around. Wherever a little hot springs come gurgling out of the ground, someone had moved a stock tank in and piped the water over to it. And you can even regulate the temperature somewhat in these stock tank hot pools where they're pretty nice. This hot springs was just okay. I don't think I would really recommend it very strongly to anyone else just because of the ease of access and all the motorhome people are coming in. We looked up on the hill beyond the hot springs and here were a couple antelope coming in pretty fast. They like to get in and chew the tender young grasses on the overflow to the hot springs and also water and get their minerals there. This one antelope is a buck and an absolutely huge one. He's got the biggest horns I think I've ever seen on an antelope. I guess maybe that hot springs material makes for big horns. He's really a giant buck and I don't know whether they have any antelope season here or not, but they may not have or maybe don't let out many permits for this area, or that guy surely wouldn't have grown such large horns. His real long horns may be a result of having good year-round feed. They probably get no snow there so he doesn't have the winter to deal with. And antelope lose the sheath off their horn every year, and if they're on good feed, they grow bigger ones on good year and smaller ones on the other year. So maybe every year he has good feed here at the hot springs. There are a total of four hot pools here, but three of them are these large stock tanks and someone's written the instructions for using this one right on the board that serves as a seat. The sunsets are very nice as the sun drops down in a little gully right across this big valley in the mountains beyond. But we're heading out now. We're about 90 miles south of Winnemucca, so we'll move on up to Winnemucca and then go through McDermott and on back into Oregon and 
go to our very favorite hot springs in Oregon right now and that's on the Owyhee River Three Forks and we can even go fishing there. The little town of Austin appears and then disappears in front of our eyes as we move north. Looks as if they have a rather healthy junkyard in the small town of Austin. We'll be through it in just a little bit and then we'll be out on the open highway. It's called the loneliest highway in America. Out on the highway we see the signs of probably an old homestead that once was here and then was swallowed up by some of the bigger ranches as seems to be the trend. It looks like they had a simple little stone house at first with a dirt roof and then they build another stone house and then build onto it with a frame house in later years. But all this is abandoned and is reduced to nothing but just ruins to this day. We steer northward and we're still in Nevada as you can gather by the looks of the sign. And then to McDermott. There's a lot of pictures of this building from a way long time ago with a lot of people standing out in front. And we asked several people in McDermott what it was. And either they didn't want to tell us or didn't know. So we never really found out what it was. But we can only guess. And of course, the white horse we can guess what that place was at one time, but it's pretty much uninhabited right now. We move through McDermott, and today is Marge's birthday, and so she wants to go to the casino there and have dinner. We had dinner and then moved north past the old jail and a few homes and we're in Oregon. This is right in the edge of Oregon. Here it says Jordan Valley, 101 miles. A young buck antelope just can't resist the temptation and so he's got a racist. And these animals are built for running. They don't even have dew claws so they can even run faster. And they love to run across the road in front of you. So whenever we see one running alongside us, we can bet that he's going to cross the road right in front of us. Then down to the windy road down in the bottom of the Waihe Canyon. And at least when we get down there and set up camp, we'll have trees for shade and a nice little stream running right by our camp. I look right across the Waihe River from where we're camped, and in the cliff beyond, I see what looks to be a cave so of course I'm going to have to go investigate it. So I'll wade the river and go over there and just see what it is. A blazing star is in full bloom as the morning breeze waves it back and forth. Then some choke cherries, not quite ripe, but they'll be ripe pretty soon and that's a pretty good crop of choke cherries. Makes me hungry just to look at them. Then the cave starts to appear in the cliff beyond. I go over and climb up into the cave and I can see it definitely has been inhabited by Stone Age Americans. 
it looks like probably some archaeologists have been here and completely cleaned it out and sifted all the stuff that was inside it and threw it over the bank. So this cave most definitely had been inhabited. It's been burned in a fire. It's well smoked up in here from probably hundreds if not thousands of years of, of fires being built in it. And this looks like about the end of the cave right here. Well, wow, this would have been a very good cave to be an inhabited. And it's real close to the river. They could have gone down and fished and picked up freshwater mussels and, and all sorts of plants around the edge of it. Plus, there's plenty of room for a very large family of people to live in here. They've even had a rock wall built in front of it here for further protection. And all this pile of dirt out front, I would say, was either shoveled out by archaeologists or pot diggers looking for souvenirs. Fragments of freshwater mussel that they've used for food and it's been in their kitchen middens. So whoever dug this just threw them out here. And these rocks that are laid out front were probably part of what they had the entrance blocked off partially with. I could look up on the hill in front of me and see the old hand-built wagon road going over the mountain. Since I can see the old road just above me a few hundred yards, I need to go up and investigate it. So I'll climb this rather steep mountain up to where I can get on the road. And there, now I'm on the road, and now I'll walk up and see where it goes. They had to keep extra horses to pull the wagons out of the canyon here. And some place right down below, right on the Owyhee River, the Owyhee River was real high, and they built a raft, and they were trying to take a wagon across that had a cannon on it. Something happened, and the cannon was lost in the river. And, of course, there are rumors that the cannon is still there, but it's not, according to military records. The cannon was retrieved later. I keep climbing the mountain as the road switches back and forth to go up over the summit of this mountain beyond. There's even some juniper trees that are growing right smack in the middle of the what was the road, so that gives you an idea how long it's been since it's been used. But the rocks that were piled here were piled very good, and they still look like they're in good shape. Then there's a flat spot on top of one of the hills where they could, a good place to let the horses blow a little bit. Then on up, and now we're to the cliffs at the, right at the summit of the mountain. And it looks like they had blasted a groove right through the mountains and that would be the steepest part of the trail yet and that'll take them right out on top so I climb up on top and look around and it looks to me as though it would have been too steep for a team to pull a wagon I see where they've drilled a hole deep into the bedrock up on top and that was probably an attachment point where they could hook pulleys and drag the wagon up and lower it down even though they had extra horses I get up on top and look at this groove that goes steeply up and then when you get on top you're home free 
It looks like you're free to cross the Owyhee Desert and go on out to where, past where our daughter's property is, out by the White Horse Ranch. When I get back to camp, I see Marge has already caught her limit of fish, and she has lost the hooks off everybody's poles. Once in a while, she'd get to pulling too hard, and she was catching some pretty nice-sized bass and trout this time. And so, with that light line, if she pulled too hard, she'd just simply break the hook off. There. That's not the biggest, is it? Well, I'll hold up the two biggest then. This one and this one? Yeah. Like this? Hold them up higher. There. A little higher. There. Just a second. Marge proudly shows off her catch of fish that she caught while I was up on the mountain. And she caught both trout and bass. So we're going to have another super fish feed. We spot an old doe antelope with twin fawns. And it looks like those fawns think it's time for dinner. So Mama will stand there and let them suck till she figures they've got enough. And then... She'll kick them off and head on about her way of grazing. She's very proud of her little fawns as they have their dinner. But when they get too rough and she runs out of milk, then it's time to give them a little bit of a gentle kick and then move on. I go up and look at the old military dugout. Now this was a house half below and half above ground and it housed soldiers that would stay here with their to take care of their heavy horses and take the heavy horses up on top to pull the mail wagon on up and out of the canyon. We go back up to the hot springs where hot water comes tumbling out of the mountain in numerous places. We go back in the pool and enjoy that nice warm water again and you can even get down below the pool and get you a shower where it comes cascading down and then dumps into the Owyhee River. The Waihe River moves nice and slow right in front of the hot springs. From the hot springs you can look downstream and see numerous other waterfalls and these are all hot water pouring out of the mountain and tumbling down into the Waihe River. The old wagon road the apparently there was a bridge right across the Hot Springs Creek and it shored up with really big boulders. I guess that's when men were men and I'll bet you they used that Hot Springs to soothe their aching muscles at the end of a hard day's work of building that road by hand. We climb up out of the Hot Springs and walk down the old road to the river and then ford the river again and we'll uh, we'll check out the there are several pools have been made by volunteers and then we can look across the river and see another old wagon road we'll head back to our campsite now which is down a little corridor with very tall grass growing along both sides of it. 
right down to River's Edge. We'll drive where we're camped. And then, since it's another day, we're going to try a little more fishing and see if we can catch us another limit of fish. And it looks like Marge is on their trail right now. And it looks like she's got him. And another one's bit in the somewhat warm waters of the Owyhee River. We kind of like to eat the bass better than we do the trout. So I'm just kind of hoping it's a nice bass, which it is. He's good enough. Good enough. He's after it, but he never took it. Is he still after it? He's about got it. He's about decided he wants to be caught. We were sitting there concentrating on fishing and we heard something wading across the river right below us. And we looked and here's a couple deer decided that was a place where they like to cross and so they're wading across the river they leisurely wade across the river and then disappear in the trees on the other side what a sight with the reflection and they're both a couple fawns they still have their spots. I don't know why their mama was letting them do that. This is about as good a fishing as you could ever hope for. Almost every cast would produce a nice bass or trout. We're catching them one right after another. And Marge cooks them in a skillet. And then when we got done cooking and decided to start fishing again, she just left the skillet set there. And a woman came down with a little dog. And the little dog found the skillet and licked it clean. He licked all the little scraps out of it and some of the stuff that she'd rolled the fish in. Then she had to scrub the skillet. To get rid of the dog germ, she said. These fish just bite all the time, and especially right from dusk to right at dusk or dawn is when they really feed. But you can catch fish just about any time you throw your. This canyon was originally named either by or for some Hawaiian fur trappers who hitched a ride over on a sailing ship. There's various different accounts of this, whichever one you want to believe, but supposedly they went into the canyon and vanished forever. But it looks like maybe one of their little hula girls might have survived it and still is here. The story is they didn't know how to spell Hawaii in English, but it just depends on which version of the story you listen to. But anyway, it the name stuck, and that's kind of the old way of spelling Hawaii. But anyway, it looks like the hula girl's having a great time, and it's a full moon. I guess that's why she's out. But I guess where we're starting to see things, we better be packing and heading for home as soon as possible. As we head out, we see a little pygmy rabbit. They're an endangered species and shouldn't be shot. 
But since we're starting to see things, we better get out of here. Then we see sage chickens galore. They're just all over the place. Old hens with their young and older chickens as well, right? Eating gravel in the road and pecking at the little weeds, getting the leaves off from them for food right alongside the road. I haven't seen these this many sage chickens in a long time. So that's a real good sign. I guess the ravens and other predators have eaten a lot of their young. But these are sure doing good and they're pecking the little leaves off the weeds right alongside the road. Group after group of them we see along the road. We must have seen somewhere around about a hundred of them. And these are the sage grouse. They're our largest grouse and a symbol of the West. And then a little group of chuckers alongside the road. It looks like they're doing good this year because we sure saw a bunch of them. And they like to eat the little leaves off the green stuff. And also one of their main feed foods are the seed the seeds off the cheek grass. And then a nice little cottontail bunny setting in the shade of a sagebrush as we move past. Now we're going over and take a look at the grave of John Baptist Charbonneau. He was Sacagawea's son and accompanied him in, in a little basket on Sacagawea's back as they traveled the west. We see an old doe deer standing down along the creek just before we get to this very important historical site. First we take a look at the ruins of Inskip Station which was a safe house and whenever there was Indian troubles, everybody congregated there. It's like a miniature fort. It even had shooting ports where they could shoot out at galloping Indians as they came screaming by them. The, about the only thing that's left standing is part, a little bit of the lower part of the building. And then the chimney is still standing pretty good at this time. When we first came here, we could see the shooting ports quite well, but that part has been erased by the passing of time. There are a few pioneer graves here, and they're basically about the same as a Christian Indian burial, burial would have been during historical times. Just a shallow grave with rocks piled on them to keep the animals from digging the body up. In later years, since this w person was so important in the history of our nation, a tombstone was erected and people from all over the world have traveled here and put trinkets on the tombstone. There are all sorts of things, lots of beads and lots of coins and various other things, right? On John Baptist Charbonneau, as a baby, was with his mother, Sacagawea, a member of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. As a man, was a pioneer of the West, of pleasant manner and esteem in the community. 1805 to 1866. Following the death of Sacagawea in 1812, young Pomp came under the guardianship of Captain William Clark and was schooled in St. Louis, Missouri. He spent six years in Europe and Africa. While abroad, he learned to speak English, Spanish, German, and French fluently, in addition to several native languages he already knew. During his stay overseas, he accompanied and was hosted by a German royal family, the Wilhelms of Wurttemberg. He then returned back to the States where he served as Alcade of San 
Louis Ray, California. His love for adventure and free spirit brought him full circle back to the natural wonders from whence he traveled as an infant child. As a guide, he taught others to appreciate the natural beauty of this great nation. We commemorative his triumph as a true example of adventure and freedom, a spirit that characterizes the great American West. There, that's